Welcome to Generating Demand, real stories from the B2B trenches, where we tell you our secrets, like how to establish thought leadership, or rock your webinar registrations, and tips and tricks to drive sales-ready leads. Lean in, listen, and learn. We've got you covered. This podcast is brought to you by Virtual Intelligence Briefing. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Generating Demand, Stories from the B2B Trenches. My name is Amanda McGuckin Hager. I'm here with John Joe Hansen, our guest today. As a reminder, this broadcast is brought to you by Virtual Intelligence Briefing, our sponsor. John is the Director of Demand Generation at Thycotic Centrify. He's a demand generation marketer of over 15 years, working in a variety of different industries through that time and working from companies as small as early stage startups to the Fortune 500 and everything in between. So uh, in true confession, John and I have met over a decade ago and we I have been watching his career and I'm so excited that he is here today as our guest. I know that it's, he has some great stories to share. So John, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. It has uh, been a pleasure getting to know you, like you said, over the last decade. <laughs> um, especially, you know, being here in Austin, um, I think uh, you were one of the first people in the marketing community um, that I that I really got to know. So appreciate you, you know, circling back around and and having me on the on the podcast. Yeah, I'm excited. I know um, you were previously at at some large companies here in town and and have a lot of demand generation stories to share. I, I will say that in a startup, demand generation to me seems um, very clear, but in as you grow into these larger organizations, it becomes much more complex. Um, and a lot of different variables, a lot of different teams, a lot of different guidance, sometimes conflicting guidance. So I know you have some great experience to share with our audience today. Um, prior to our recording, you and I were talking, you have a couple stories to share, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll just let you let you start. So go ahead, John, tell us Tell us what, sure. you're, what you have. Sure, sure. And I'll start with, uh, with, I guess, kind of my definition around demand generation. Um, so what I see my role and, and the role of demand gen is to take the messages that, that we're developing internally, you know, take the branding that, that we've got and all of those resources. We're getting that out the door. We're getting that outside the walls of the company and we're taking it to the market and finding out, you know, how are they going to react? And are we going to be bringing in the leads, you know, bringing in the results that we then pass along to the sales team that start to drive those marketing results? So we really sit, you know, right there in the middle um, between all of the product marketing and, and content development and brand work that's going on. And then all of the sales work and closing, you know, creating opportunities and closing them. Uh, that's happening on the sales side. So it's a really exciting place to be. Uh, it's it's part of the, you know, one of the things that I really love about demand gen. We're so hands-on um, and we're so active in, in getting things done. Yeah, I will say that active is a key word here. Uh, <laughs> the work that we do really does have the power to drive the sales pipeline and drive the business um, should the company allow for that. Um, and sometimes companies don't, as you and I both know. Yes. Um, yeah, I think you said it very well. So we had a story of, um, of something not working. Yes. <clears throat> so when I think about demand gen working, I think about what is repeatable. Because you, you may have heard demand gen called the demand engine. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is. You are going to be running campaigns over and over and over. And when you can find something that works and figure out, okay, how do I standardize that? Mm -hmm. It just helps. Uh, it helps that workflow, you know, come much, much more easily. Yeah. So, so the first example that I have is something that started out uh, that we felt was going to be repeatable. And, and so this was at a, a larger company. Um, they had a, a very established set of products um, with long-term uh, user bases, and those portfolios were starting to come together. 
you know, there was kind of some consolidation happening and, and looking for opportunities to collect some of those individual products into more of a solution. Okay. Um, Which is not an uncommon thing for larger companies, right? They'll have these point solutions or point tools or, or services, products even that they'll, they'll combine into a collective sort of business unit or solution, especially when they're making the switch from a transactional sales model to a enterprise type solution cell, right? right. Yep. Yeah. And, and so one of the, uh, one of the things that the sales team um, for, for one of the products uh, was doing was they would host a user forum. Okay. And, and so we decided to, uh, <laughs> marketing decided we wanted to participate and help, uh, you know, help scale those. And okay. so we got involved. Um, we were able to partner really well with the sales team and start to add some of the additional products. Um, and so we added some additional sessions. Um, we started getting to the point where we needed a, a larger venue. Um, so marketing took on, you know, finding that space, um, doing that contracting. And that's essentially what kind of happened over a, a, a couple of quarters um, is, is we would just grow it a little bit more and grow it a little bit more. Um, it always went well. You know, our, our sales team uh, was very enthusiastic about it. The customers really appreciated uh, being able to get together. But it culminated uh, in this event that that I was very heavily um, involved in in organizing and and felt like I was kind of shifting my role to be more event marketing mm -hmm. uh, because of you know the 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 size that this event uh, eventually came to and I was renting out uh, you know space in a hotel in New York and and we were inviting you know our general manager of our business unit to be the keynote speaker and you know. It, the the costs kept kind of creeping up and we kept mm -hmm. going back to procurement and we're like can we just add a little more a little more <laughs> um and eventually got to the point where the venue came back and was like and told us you know we're not going to be able to seat people uh for the meals that you have planned with oh, wow. the you know the number of registrations that that you're now aiming for oh wow so so True capacity constraints. Yes. <laughs> Physically. And and so I had to tell my team at the time, you know, we're gonna stand out in the hallway um, you know, during some of these, and you know, we'll we'll make sure everybody gets fed, but but we're gonna have to kind of be the behind the scenes and and not be uh as present uh during some of that. So that is an example of uh well, I should say that event event marketing is its own animal. Um, yes. Demand generation is, is if we're lucky, involved in the objective of some of those events. Um, if we're really lucky, we're driving the event strategy so that it aligns with demand gen, but oftentimes that doesn't happen. Oftentimes the event team is, is separate and distinct. Um, but you bring up a really good point of, uh, the scalability of that type of event, especially when you have such a resource heavy program, the dollars and the, uh, the time and the, the lead time and the coordination of all the different pieces, events are a very, what I would call heavy program from a, a almost not a burden, but sort of not an onus either. I don't know the word I'm looking for, but the maybe resource laden, uh, that's a good program. Way to yeah. yeah. And, and so the unfortunate conclusion, even though each of the individual events had been successful, after we ran that, the, that uh, what became the last one, um, it was so big, we got, you know, some additional scrutiny on it. And then as often happens at big companies, there was some reorganization and mm -hmm. the, the new leadership came back and they're like, we don't want to invest that much. We, we don't think that's the right place to continue to grow the investment. So, you know, it, we, we outpaced what we were able to keep up with and it, and it ended up killing the program because we couldn't get the support for it any longer. Yeah. I think, you know, one thing that 
drives me. I'm a big fan of efficiency in all assets of my life. I was a single parent and, you know, we were walking out the door at 7 a.m. My children are older now, but walking out the door at 7 a.m. and then school after school, baseball practice, you know, dinner, walking in again at nine. And there are so many things that need to get done in a day that efficiency is really key to getting all those things mm -hmm. done. When I think about programs like this, you know, our resources are finite, our money, our company's money, our people, our time, it's all a finite resource and making that uh, trade off, right, from this big kind of heavy, expensive event, which may have had a very successful outcome, but how do you repeat that to your point? How do you repeat that and scale that uh, mm -hmm. into a repeatable program without running up against those resource constraints? And it sounds like leadership also had that same you know, cost benefit analysis at play. And they decided ultimately the cost was too great for the benefit perceived benefit. Yep. Yep. So yeah, you, I mean, is... you hit it right on the head. Um, you know, it, uh, it, it definitely produced, um, you know, solid pipeline because we mm -hmm. had the sales team there. Mm -hmm. Um, but the amount of effort that went into it was going to be a challenge for the team. Um, you know, especially as, as our portfolio continued to grow, mm -hmm. it was going to be a challenge to, to keep replicating that kind of success. Yeah. And I think yeah. about that as, as like, let's say you're a company with territories and yep. you want to do a territory, you know, a Northeast territory event, and then a Southeast territory mm -hmm. event, and then a Northwestern, mm -hmm. you get into the scale, uh, and the repeatability factor really quickly when you do these territory, territory in field events. Um, not to mention we're all bumping up against the COVID pandemic on these challenges, uh, which is yet another factor that makes it hard. But um, so what what was your big learning out of that? What would be if you could, you know, for the audience out there, for new marketers, how were there any red flags or was there anything that uh, you learned from that event that you could share as a insight? Yeah, um, I, I definitely learned a couple of things. Um, one, especially as a as a hands on marketer, um, be confident in helping set the boundaries around mm -hmm. the scope of a program. That's great um, advice. You know, you That's really great. <laughs> you you always do want to try and stretch yourself. I I totally understand that, um, but when you're working, especially when you're working with leadership that maybe doesn't have as direct a background in demand generation, it's very easy to think bigger and, mm -hmm. and to want to, you know, make a bigger splash, you know, go, you know, go higher um, with, with whatever you're doing. And so being able to say, you know, the results that we're trying to get require this much effort. Mm -hmm. and if we, if we keep it to that level of effort, then we can also do these other, you know, activities that are going to produce results as well. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. And I, that is, um, it leads me to think of the marketing mix, right? As demand mm -hmm. gen, we're looking at the marketing mix across. This is Madison, my cat, by the way, she comes <laughs> into every podcast without fail. Um, but as we look at the marketing mix, we're looking at, at least I generally look at what emails are going out, what events are happening, what, um, what third party programs are we running and looking at all of these things together. I call that my big yeah. sort of Tetris game of how does it all fit together to drive the objectives that we need to drive as a company and, um, yeah, making sure that that doesn't, the scope creep, mm -hmm. as we call it, the, the scope doesn't creep out to make, uh, to absorb the rest of the marketing mix, uh, to your really? point. So you also have a story of uh, success. I do. <laughs> that I'm eager to hear. Uh, so at a at another company, um, different so different scenario. Um, this was a smaller company, about a hundred million uh, in revenue, mm -hmm. uh, focused on the ed tech industry. Um, so still, you know, more of a B to B to B sale, um, mm -hmm. although we were selling to school districts. Okay, um, so as a, as a a, I would call that a sled type yeah. sale, right? Uh, yep. State and local government education. Exactly. Um, 
which is sometimes laden with uh, bureaucracy in your buying cycles, right? The buying cycles are not necessarily the easiest. The buying timeframes can be long. Um, there can be a lot of uh, hoops to jump through. It does uh, feel very much like a state and local government type of sale. It has kind of its mm -hmm. own feel to it. It does. Um, uh, so the, the bureaucracy, um, yes, but also that kind of personal connection. Um, yes. You know, because they want to feel like they're working with somebody who understands the needs of their specific area, you know, their specific students and, and the situation that they're in. Yes. Uh, you bring up an incredibly good point. Um, many years ago, I sold uh, into colleges and it very much was a per there was a lot of personal touches. Yep. You know, so and so just had a new grandbaby. Well, we're going to be sending her a card. Everybody sign the card. We're taking a picture, right, to send to this one client. So there was a lot of that um, personability in those mm -hmm. uh, in those sales cycles and in those relationships. So, to to you know, coming into that landscape, um, one of the campaigns that that I initiated was to do a direct mailer uh, with some of the company literature, but then also an introductory letter um, for new sales reps that were, you know, that were picking up new territories. Um, and so it came personalized to, uh, you know, the typically the superintendent, okay. um, you know, described a little bit about their background, their connection to, you know, to the location. Um, and then we included their picture uh, at the bottom of that letter. And started to, to mail those out, like I had mentioned, for new sales reps. And so, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sidetrack a little bit here. But we were able to do this because it was almost like an account-based marketing play where we okay. knew the, the school districts that were going to be in their territory. So we knew who we wanted to, you know, to get this letter in front of. Because so, um, all of this is public information, right? So you're able to get the, you're able to identify your persona target mm -hmm. through that public information, and uh, which does make it feel like an account-based uh, right. marketing initiative. Yeah. I, I want to ask you some specifics about the mailer. So you mentioned a personalized letter mm -hmm. with a picture. Did you fold this in three and send it in a normal business size envelope? Was this mm -hmm. a flat envelope? Did it include other? flyers or mailers tell me a little bit more about yeah, that yeah that's uh that that's a very important question um so we actually mailed this out in a 9 by 12 envelope uh, okay so the letter stayed flat um and then it included a folder um with you know a couple of things that that we had you know kind of standard collateral um but okay. that we could also personalize you know what went in there Okay. Do they really need, you know, extra attention on math? You know, we can put a flyer in uh, with some of that information. Do they need, you know, a different subject or a different type of, uh, you know, resources? So, so we were, you know, we had all the collateral already developed, but we were able to pick and choose, you know, what should go into the, the packages for the territory. Uh, you know, it wasn't down to the individual send, but but for the territory, you know, what did okay. what did they want to focus on? Okay, that is a. I was going to ask you how many people were in this list, <laughs> and did you have to do this one by one, and how did you execute that? So you did it by the territory, and then the letters was the letter also by territory, or was that personalized on a one to one basis? That was personalized on a one to one basis. So we were. And how able did to you get execute those. that? Um, so it actually, you know, I. I it wasn't too difficult um, because okay. we worked with uh, we worked with a mailing company. Um, oh, great. We worked with a production company that was able to do the variable, uh, you know, the variables in the, okay. in the letter like a printing. mail merge and type. Then, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, and then match that up, you know, and and make sure that the package was all in sync. Uh, you know, nice. the person getting it was also the person on the letter inside. Nice. Um, okay, great. That helps me sort of wrap my head around the yeah. story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, so we started, uh, so we actually started to see really good results from that. Um, the, the new sales reps were getting inbound phone calls, um, nice. you know, coming from these school districts and, and they were starting to set up meetings. Um, and, 
And so what, you know, so then my sales team that, that was more well-established in their territory said, well, hey, I've got some school districts that I can't get into. Can you do this for me? That's awesome. Um, that is awesome. But the way that we had had set it up, you know, we had a process. We knew how to, uh, you know, how to write that introduction, how to get that, you know, all those files and, and selections over to our uh, production vendor, how we were tracking it, um, you know, as it went out and, and you know, the metrics coming back in. So, so we had that kind of well-defined. And so when, you know, these other salespeople wanted to, to get involved, we were able to just create a calendar. Say, okay, nice. we can't, you know, we can't do everybody at once. Right. Um, but we can start to ramp up how many we're doing because it's going, you know, all over the U.S. So we're not, you know, overlapping uh, who's getting, uh, you know, that, that kind of introduction. Um, so we were able to start saying, okay, we can do X number of these campaigns every month. And then we started to fill in, uh, you know, the, the sales team. So did you do it by, uh, by month, by territory or by month, by like, were you supporting one person's territory or mm -hmm. were they you doing a subset of their accounts every month? That's a great question. And, and maybe I need to, to step back. So we, we had, um, you know, we had about 50 sales reps, um, across okay. the U S okay. um, and so we would look at it and say, okay, we can do three sales reps. Uh, in a month, for example. Oh, I see. Okay. And so we would just pick three. We would get the list for their whole territory and we would send that out, uh, you know, and we would send that out. And you would say to the sales team, you know, Bob, Mark, John, you guys are in February. Tim, Scott, <laughs> you know, Jeff, you guys are in. Yes. Yes. You know, that's March, exactly right. Et cetera. That's exactly right. And. I unintentionally chose all male names. I probably should have chosen some female <laughs> names in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, it, it was very, uh, you know, exciting for the sales team, you know, because they, you know, they were seeing direct results. Um, we built a, a ton of pipeline um, through, you know, getting them into um, accounts or, or in this case districts that they might not have had a way in uh, to previously. Um, and, you know, on the campaign side, you know, we were able to, like I had mentioned, we were able to really structure it so that it didn't require somebody, you know, to sit down every time and say, okay, how are we going to do this? What are we going to put into these packages? You know, we didn't have to scope it. So we knew what we were going to do and we were able to just build it in to the, to the overall plans that we, that we had. Yeah, that is a great story of taking something, sort of testing it in the market, seeing the success. You know it's successful when the sales team come to you and say, we want that. <laughs> that is the ultimate compliment of any demand gen Absolutely. marketer. How can we get more of that? That was amazing. Um, so that is such a good story. And I'm really excited that it came out of a, a sort of a sled, you know, mm -hmm. education environment, which is sometimes kind of challenging. So um, to have a successful campaign like that in that environment is truly an accomplishment. So kudos. Thank you. Yeah. And I love the repeatability of it. Um, that is a, a key mantra of mine is how do we repeat and scale this? How do we get this process down that we can repeat and scale, mm -hmm. um, which is so critical in, in building growth, right? Absolutely. So. It absolutely is. <laughs> So you, uh, we have time for one sort of little uh, side. You had okay. uh, one other thing you wanted to talk about or potentially share with the audience. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to dive into that? Sure, sure. Thank you. So, as I was kind of thinking through what I wanted to to share, you know, the positive and the negative, it really did hit me. You know, because demand generation tends to spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you know, do. <laughs> <laughs> for marketing, um, it is so important for us to understand our internal procurement processes mm -hmm. um, because those can really trip you up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I won't go into my examples there, but um, no joke, no joke. And then, and then, you know, the follow up to that 
is really finding and working with good vendors. Mm -hmm. um, because that I have found really helps, especially with that repeatability. Um, marketing teams tend to run lean. Um, you know, we, we've got enough hands to kind of keep things moving and, and, and get things, you know, organized. Um, but when it comes to the, the execution, you know, and, and getting, you know, the, the scale that we're looking for, we've got to go partner with, um, you know, with other companies and with other vendors to, to help us do that. Yeah. So, you know, looking for, and, and so what I'm always looking for is, you know, one, are they able to execute what they've committed to? Um, and then two, if we wanted to do, you know, the same thing again, how, how easy is it for us uh, to, to make that happen? For, um, and if you for can, the company internally to scale that, uh, is the vendor capable and, and uh, willing to scale with you? And can right. your internal team support that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, my brain went right to having a good relationship with your CFO and an mm -hmm. understanding of your budget oh, yes. and making sure that you don't go and again, I think of this as yet another Tetris game in marketing, which is what is my budget? What are my objectives? And how can I do that marketing mix from not only from what programs am I going to run, but from a resource perspective, from an in-house perspective or an outsource perspective. And then also um, looking, I tend to look at it too, from a brand demand generation mm -hmm. and a strategic projects perspective when I look into um, the marketing efficiency of it. Um, so yeah, the vendor relationships are key. They really key. are. <laughs> Having a good vendor can make all the difference. And, you know, I'm going to have a shameless uh, plug <laughs> of virtual intelligence briefing right now who sponsors this podcast and who has an incredibly high uh, conversion from uh, repeat mm -hmm. customers uh, because they work so hard to deliver the customer experience and they are results driven. Um, that's one of the things I admire about them is, is supporting people like you and I in our roles and making sure that um, we are successful inside our organizations. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we've come to the time of our podcast. We have just a few minutes left. Um, I like to ask all of our guests, you know, we've, mm -hmm. we've had the benefit of experience at this point. We've come a long way in our careers. We've seen a lot of different marketing problems and put our hands on a lot of different uh, you know, potential solutions, some successful, some not, as we've just discussed. Um, but we all, I think we all rely on different resources to help us both in our professional skills, as well as our professional development. And so I'd like to ask you, as you were up and coming, what resources did you find really valuable that you'd like to share with some of our audience members? Absolutely. So the first one that I'll share is a site called Marketing Profs. Mm -hmm. Um, they have so much content. It, it covers so many different areas of marketing. Um, but what I really like about them is they've been consistent. Um, so to your point, you know, I started reading them very early in my career mm -hmm. and I still find things today uh, that are that are relevant to me, you know, as I as I continue to progress. Um, yeah, they have they have a great newsletter uh, that they make it easy to sign up for. Um, and then nice. they also have a ton of topical blogs, um, you know, that, that you can find on their site. And, and those are kind of the two areas that I tend to, to, to look at the most. Yeah. Marketing Profs is an oldie but goodie, right? And continues to be a classic core, I think, of um, the marketing profession, especially B2B demand generation, um, but other B2B marketing mm -hmm. um, examples. And so if you haven't been there yet, I do encourage you to go. Their resources is broad, but as John said, their newsletter is a classic. Um, sign up for it, read it, know it, you know, look forward to it. It's filled with substance. Um, and, and uh, yeah, of course the blogs as well. Yep. Did you have another one? I do have another one. So awesome. the second one uh, that I've looked at more recently in the last, uh, you know, four to five years is um, a, a company called Activate and it's their state of demand gen. And it's an annual report that they put out. And it's become really important for me to kind of see where the trends are headed uh, mm -hmm. for demand generation. 
so that I can go back and and get ahead of you know that budget conversation and and know you know okay do I need to start thinking about adjusting my marketing mix how do I want to start planning for the upcoming year you know the the next things that that we need to try um, or things that maybe maybe we need to pull back on so yeah that one that one has been very helpful in terms of understanding directionally what to start thinking about. Yeah, where the market's going at large, right? Yeah. Um, the the report is the Activate State of Demand Generation Annual Report. And I'm not exaggerating or joking when I say that I have a tab open with that report <laughs> right now, this very moment. I've had it open for about uh, a week as I'm working on a survey of my own. Um, and that the I find it as well incredibly insightful to understand where that where the market where all of us are moving at large uh, together as a community. So that's a great resource. Thank you. You're welcome, John. It has been a pleasure. It's been so fun to catch up with you, and I really have a lot of gratitude for you to come on and and share both your positive story of success and your uh, story of learning. I'll call it. That's a, that's a great way to frame it. And uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, this was a lot of fun. It was fun. Thank you so much, John. Until next time. All right. Goodbye. Bye-bye. If you have any questions, want to suggest topics, or have ideas for guest speakers, drop us a line at podcast at virtualintelligencebriefing.com. To learn more of our demand generation secrets, visit vibriefing.news or grab the link in our show notes.